Greetings, church history friends, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Barb Walden, and tonight I will serve as your host in the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation's Church History Without Boundaries Autumn Lecture Series. We greatly appreciate you joining us as we continue to explore Community of Christ history around the world. In this evening's program, we will hear about church history in Korea from our guest speaker, Steve Shields. Now, if Steve appears to be quite comfortable while giving this lecture, there's a good reason for that. This is the second time he has shared the history of Korea. The first was last Thursday. And he shared that history with well over 100 people. It was a wonderful program. Unfortunately, technology dealt us an awful hand of cards that night. And I regret that the recording from Steve's incredible lecture was lost. However, Steve has very, very graciously and generously agreed to present the lecture again for you, our viewing audience, who may not have had the opportunity to share with us last Thursday. This is an incredible gift of time and knowledge, and I truly cannot thank Steve enough for his willingness to share the history of the church in Korea a second time. Steve, you are both a historian and a saint tonight. Thank you so very much. Well, our Church History Without Boundaries Autumn Lecture Series is not only a great way to spend the evening learning church history, it's also a benefit for the Community of Christ Historic Sites. You see, the sites are temporarily closed for public safety due to COVID-19. However, the preservation and maintenance needs of the sites continues on, and your donations are especially critical during this year as the loss of revenue from site preservation fees and museum store sales is unprecedented. So as we continue to work towards the goal of becoming self-sustaining, your donations from tonight's lecture will go a long way towards supporting and preserving Community of Christ historic sites for future generations. If you'd like to make an online donation, Megan has dropped the donations link in the chat box just now. You're also welcome to send a donation in the mail to the address found in the box. Thank you for helping preserve church heritage with your generous donations. In addition to praising Steve for his grace in presenting a second time, I also want to take a moment to formally introduce him. Stephen L. Shields is a retired Community of Christ World Church appointee who served as the founding president of the East Asia Mission Center and leader of the church's work in Korea from 1996 to 2004. He's a past president of the John Whitmer Historical Association and is president-elect of the Royal Asiatic Society Korea. He also writes historical and op-ed columns for the Korea Times there in Seoul. Steve is a high priest in Community of Christ and divides his time between Seoul and the United States, that is when pandemic restrictions are not in place. So tonight, he is speaking to us from his home in Korea. Welcome, Steve. Welcome again. And thank you for joining us. I'll turn the microphone over to you as we are all ready to hear about the story of Community of Christ in Korea. Thanks, Barb. <clears throat> I'm, I'm pleased to have been invited to do the lecture, and I'm more than happy to do it again so that you have a video recording on the website. <laughs> uh, Community of Christ's encounter with Asia began in the aftermath of the Second World War uh, as the influx of US military members, government employees, and diplomatic staff took up residence in both Japan and Korea as part of the American occupation of the region. Uh, work then centered on giving ministry to the expat church members. Um, when the Korean War exploded in 1950, there was a massive buildup of American military presence on the Korean Peninsula. And a 1953 census, just after the ceasefire was declared, found six, 76 known uh, American expat church members resident in Japan and Korea. Uh, in Korea, the church has always looked much like that in America. The first 
uh, indigenous members were baptized and the first worship services organized by American church members who came from an era when the church promoted itself as the one true church with the Book of Mormon. Uh, it seems logical then, uh, seemed logical to those well-intentioned members that the model of worship, the polity, the uh, message of the church and, and even the hymns uh, promoted in the United States and in other English speaking countries were relevant in every cultural scenario. This idea prevailed uh, at the highest levels of denominational leaders. Uh, William or Bill as everyone knew him, Wenham, uh, a 20 something ironic priest who was in the United States Army stationed in Busan, Korea about 300 miles south of Seoul, shared his testimony with several Korean high school age students that he met there. The group met regularly. Uh, Wenham taught them about the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith. And in November 1954, uh, the first baptisms of indigenous church members in Asia took place when Wenham baptized 17 young people in the sea at a beach near Pusan. Uh, the first Koreans who were baptized included Lee Hae Joon and uh, Song Joon Hwa. Brother Song later introduced Johan Gu to the church. These people, some of whom were in Seoul, began taking part in worship in a small group in Seoul. Um, Wenham, of course, as an ironic priest, did not confirm these people. They were confirmed later uh, in early in 1955 uh, when uh, an elder in the church uh, who was a military member in Seoul was able to confirm them. Um, <clears throat> baptisms followed um, when uh, Bill Wenham completed his military duty and returned to the United States late in 1955. A couple of Korean students went to Graceland University, then Graceland College, in 1956 and 57 with help from American church members. Uh, Lee Hae-joon spent five years in the United States and under the tutelage of Roy Chevelle, he translated the Book of Mormon into Korean. In November of 1957, uh, Johan Guk, who was not yet baptized, wrote church headquarters that although there were no longer any expatriate church members meeting with them, worship gatherings continued. He asked on behalf of the group in Seoul for missionaries to be sent. Two years later, Charles D. Neff and D. Blair Jensen, both apostles in the church, visited Japan and Korea. It was in December of 1959. Uh, those two men were welcomed to the worship services that were being held at a private uh, academy classroom in, in Seoul. On December 20th, 1959, Johan Guk and others uh, were baptized by Apostles Neff and Jensen, who also confirmed them. They met at the Seventh-day Adventist Church building in the eastern part of Seoul, which had been borrowed for the occasion. Uh, worship services were moved to a classroom at the Dental College at Seoul National University in Seoul where Johan Guk was a student and some of the other early church members also were dental students. Uh, by the end of 1959, membership in Korea was about eight times that of Japan with 50 members compared to six or seven. The first baptisms in Japan took place a year or two later than those in Korea. In the spring of 1960, the first uh, missionary to Korea, William T. Guthrie and his wife, Jane, uh, arrived at Incheon Port. Church facilities were rented at Mokdong in Seoul. They started recreational programs, including basketball and ping pong. A lot of young people were attracted to that program and uh, many of those young people were later baptized. In 1961, approximately an acre and a half was purchased at Yanidong, about five miles west of the Seoul city center. Uh, the land was intended for building houses for missionaries and uh, a large church facility. You saw that uh, picture of that church building at the beginning. Uh, the village of Yanidong was a ramshackle collection of mud huts and tents with no roads, no electricity, no running water. 
Um, <clears throat> when Brother Lee Hae Joon returned to Korea in 1961, he began working with the Guthries and helping them in the mission work and uh, as the building project began. Uh, in the spring of 1961, Apostle Neff and Elder Guthrie uh, ordained the first Korean priesthood members. Lee Hae Joon was ordained to the office of elder. Jo Han Guk was ordained a priest. Uh, many new church members were also baptized that month. And uh, later on, the president of the church, W. Wallace Smith, along with Bishop Baldwin, visited Korea. Uh, worship services were moved to another location where Johan Guk was installed as the first Korean branch president. Uh, Lee Hae Joon began work translating the Doctrine and Covenants. Also in 1961, it was a big year that year, uh, Les Gardner and his family arrived in Korea as missionaries. The congregation started a work camping program under Les's leadership and began to learn many new hymns. In addition to training new and potential priesthood members, the missionaries started welfare relief programs. Uh, in September, on September 7th, in fact, 1963, the new church building was consecrated. Uh, Elder Guthrie had taken the main leadership responsibility of, con of the uh, construction projects. Uh, and uh, he was installed as the first branch president of the Yanidong branch. The final service in that building was held almost 40 years to the day in September 2003, uh, when the property was sold to make, make it possible to have funds to build a modern facility nearby. The Seoul Church remains one of the only budget neutral uh, church building projects in the history of Community of Christ. In fact, the project uh, was budget negative with about 15% of the proceeds retained as an endowment fund. Uh, Chohan Guk was ordained an elder in April of 63. Apostle Neff uh, visited Korea and reorganized the Korea church. Uh, and in April of that year, also the Guthries left uh, Korea due to Sister Guthrie's illness. Uh, Ralph and Beryl Ferret arrived with their couple of their children from Australia to replace the Guthries. Uh, also in September of 63, a new branch was organized in another part of Seoul in a rented house. Uh, worship services there were conducted under the leadership of Johan Guk as branch president. Uh, branch meeting places, not being permanent, but rented, moved around uh, the neighborhood a little bit. And uh, uh, Elder Johan Guk continued to be branch president for a couple of years in that kind of a moving target congregation. Uh, Elder uh, Pak Chi Song became branch president at Yanidong. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in uh, 1965, other property was purchased in other parts of the city where uh, small buildings were uh, uh, erected to, con to have uh, permanent worship uh, places for the, con for the branches. Um, in January of 1966, Elder Gardner and his family moved to Hawaii where uh, he pursued doctoral uh, studies at the, at the university there and subsequently as Many people, uh, longtime people in the church would know, became a professor at Graceland College in Iowa. In uh, April of 1966, uh, one uh, smaller branch of the church was merged into the Yanidong branch. And uh, then uh, in uh, July of 1966, uh, Yanidong branch president Pak Chi Sung opened a new branch at, at Kumodong. Um, Part of the reason for merging uh, smaller branches was that as the transportation, uh, public transportation got developed, uh, it was easier for people to hop on a bus for a short ride to another part of the city where we had permanent facilities rather than rented facilities. Uh, also in 1966, uh, branches were opened in a couple of other places in, in Seoul and uh, 
In August of 66, the Korea Church was organized into two districts. The Seoul Missionary District, headed by Cho Han Guk as district president, had four congregations, and the South Missionary District, with Pak Chi Song as district president, had three in cities outside of Seoul. Uh, the Ferrets left Korea in August of 67, and in uh, early in 68, Phil and Darlene Caswell arrived in Korea to uh, take up the work. Also in 68, uh, Bill Guthrie came back to Korea for a, a six-month term as a volunteer missionary. On April 1st, 1968, a clinic sponsored by the World Church was opened uh, in uh, Asan County, uh, quite a distance south from Seoul. It's about 75 to 80 miles south of Seoul. Uh, in today's transport and highway world, that trip between Asan and Seoul can be made in about 45 to 50 minutes. In 1968, it took most of a day to make the trip in a Jeep which is what we had as the church car. Uh, Esme Smith, a nurse from Australia who had been working in Korea for a few years, uh, staffed the clinic. She was later joined by another nurse, Dorcas Wilkinson, uh, who also served as, who then became director of the clinic. Dorcas's husband, Larry, became the pastor. Larry and Dorcas's two boys were both born uh, at that clinic long time ago <laughs> that, that countryside area was such a different world in those days you may be familiar with uh, dorcas's book uh, called gifts from korea it's been uh, it was published 20 some years ago now but a wonderful story if you can get a hold of a copy um, after several years of editorial work on part of some of the elders in the church uh, lee had june's uh, late 1950s translation of the Book of Mormon was finally published in 73, and the Doctrine and Covenants followed a few months later. When I arrived in 1996, one of my tasks was to bring the Doctrine and Covenants up to date. It had, uh, the translation in 73 had up through section 150, and uh, there were a few more additions that uh, needed to be made, and I have continued to make those additions as the church uh, prophet president provides those things for us. Uh, Caswell organized the first Asia Pacific Conference, which was held in Hong Kong in 1975. And uh, it, uh, the conference was probably the first large scale event ever uh, the church ever held in Asia. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. During my time in Korea, we held at least two other large scale leadership conferences. Uh, for the whole of Asia. One was in Seoul, one was in the Philippines. And we held two international uh, youth forums, uh, one at Hong Kong in 2005 and another in Thailand in 2009. Uh, each of those included more than 100 young people and leaders from several countries in Asia. Uh, the Caswells returned to the United States in June of 77. Uh, and uh, Caswell continued to be the regional administrator for the Orient region until he was called as an apostle in 1978. As a young Mormon missionary in the summer and fall of 1976, I visited the Community of Christ compound several times and met Phil and Darlene and their boys. We had some interesting discussions, especially about this newly ordained president designate uh, for the church, which I thought was rather curious. Uh, little did I know that 20 years later, I would be Phil's uh, expat missionary successor and would be living in the very house that Phil and Darlene lived in. When the Caswells left, uh, Elder Johan Kuk was uh, the branch president at Yanidong and also took responsibilities uh, for mission president at the time. Uh, when he was ordained as an evangelist, Elder Joe was succeeded by Elder Kim Won Ho as branch president, but he continued as the mission president. Uh, when I arrived in 96, I became the both the pastor and the mission president uh, in Seoul. 
During the 1960s and 1970s, church membership continued to increase. A middle school for girls was opened at the Annie Dome Church and it operated from 74 until the mid-1980s when the government introduced uh, tuition-free middle schools. In 1989, the Korean government launched a national medical insurance program ensuring low-cost medical care for all, and the church's clinic deep in the countryside south of Seoul was redundant and closed. By the mid-1970s, relief distribution had ceased and membership began to taper off. Uh, a new missional focus proved elusive. Some of the girls from the school attended church and were baptized, but their participation was not long lasting, not from lack of interest, but because when they graduated from school and got married or got jobs, they moved to those areas where their husbands lived or the jobs were located. We also saw a lot of emigration in the 1970s and, and until the early 1990s that decimated the church membership in Korea. Rather than a resident full-time support staff uh, who were living in the culture and learning the language, administrative leadership was based mainly in the United States. Leaders made periodic but relatively short visits to Korea and often had duties in several other countries in Asia. The development of the church was challenging at best. In the mid-1980s, Larry Wilkinson was assigned to Korea as a visiting missionary, traveling to Korea several times each year. His assignment ended sometime in 1988 or 89. He had served uh, before in the countryside with his wife and Esme Smith, so he knew Korea. Scott and Betty Liston, a retired couple from Independence, volunteered their services for six months beginning in September of 87. They lived in one of the houses on the church property and served in pastoral and supportive uh, roles they returned to the U.S. in March of 88. Eight years later, I was assigned to Korea as resident missionary uh, and uh, took up uh, the responsibilities of uh, mission president and pastor at the church in Seoul. My association with the church had begun in 1982 at World Conference, where as a recently baptized church member, I served as an interpreter for the Korean delegates. By 1996, all the congregations except for Yanidong had closed. The only other church property uh, that was still owned by the church was at Kumho Dong, where the congregation had ceased meeting in the early 1980s. I sold that property in 1997 and used the proceeds to renovate the mission house and the uh, church building in Yanidong. A, a new roof was put on the church, the houses were renovated and modernized including some insulation and windows and things like that to help make them uh, more livable. When Apostle Jack Kirkpatrick launched the World Service Corps program in 1999, Korea was one of the two pilot locations, the other being the Philippines. In the succeeding years until World Service Corps ended about uh, 2017, uh, dozens of young adults spent their summers in Korea working with Vacation Bible School and other ministry initiatives a good number of those volunteers served uh, one-year terms. Late in 1999, Elizabeth Else was assigned to Korea as part of the Transformation 2000 program. Uh, she served until late 2002, returned to the States, and subsequently returned to Korea several times for short-term assignments. The church in Asia was reorganized into mission centers beginning in the fall of 2003. I became the first president of the East Asia Mission Center, which included Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and China. Sale of the church property at Yanni Dong was completed late in 2003, and the church moved into rented space a few hundred yards east of the original location where the congregation met for the next few years. Early in 2004, Apostle Kirkpatrick assigned me as leadership development minister for the East Asia Mission, or for the whole Asia Mission field. Uh, which included the Philippines and India and Sri Lanka, Nepal. And my home and office was relocated to international headquarters in Missouri, but I spent most of my time on the road in Asia. 
Gary Logan was assigned as Mission Center President in June of 2004 and became pastor of Yanidong Congregation in 2006 when Rob and Barb Mills, who had replaced Elizabeth Else in 2002, returned to the United States. Gary served until 2009. He finished the church building project. The new church building, located only about a mile from the original site, was dedicated in May 2009. Adam Wade and his family were assigned to Korea in 2009, and uh, Adam became the uh, pastor at Yanidong and also the mission center president. Uh, he returned to Australia when he was appointed as president of 70 at World Conference in 2013. Blair White was assigned to Korea in 2014, but had to cut short the assignment due to family matters. Uh, he was eventually succeeded by Matthew Swain and his wife, Irina, from Canada. Swain is now finishing his final months of a several year assignment and will return to Canada in January of 2021. The church in Korea now stands at the point where it was in the late 1970s and 1980s, uh, relying solely on local priesthood and members to run the congregation. Community of Christ in Korea has yet to reach the critical mass necessary for relevant ministry led by indigenous leadership. Although the earliest members were converted to the message of restoration, missionary efforts became consumed with relief efforts due to the devastated Korean economy and infra infrastructure in the aftermath of the Korean War. Additionally, the frequent rotation of resident full-time support staff and a 20-year absent of resident staff between 1977 and 1996, uh, coupled with uh, those folks being given administrative duties rather than as mentors through side-by-side -side leadership has not been helpful in developing a stable cadre of indigenous leaders. The message of the church as it began engagement in Asia was no different from the message as understood by the church in Western nations. Les Gardner told me that the message given to the people in Korea was the simple restoration story. The Christian church had gone into apostasy and Joseph Smith was the instrument of restoration. However, the restored church was not well grounded with when uh, hit with leadership crisis and persecution. As a result, false doctrine crept in. Brigham Young led many away from the truth. So the church had to be reorganized. However, uh, Gardner said the way he understood and taught the message was not that the church was the only true church but that its message was truth-based. The message was the traditional story of Joseph Smith, but without claims to exclusivity. Uh, he said, quote, the important thing is not that all others were useless, but that our story happened and we had confidence in the unique message of the church and the church was true to its sense and understanding of God's call, end quote. Yet one of the first printed leaflets gave a comparison of fundamental beliefs of community of Christ and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Mission, which was focused on helping the poor, was relatively simple in those early years. Most Koreans were desperately poor. The U.S. dollar went a lot further then. Goods and services were cheap compared to the United States economy. But with the development of the Korean economy, the US dollar began to buy less and less until Community of Christ financial resources got priced out of the market. We don't have enough money to support local full-time church staff and leaders. Uh, welfare work consumed much of the missionary's time in the 1960s. Les Gardner estimated that he spent half his time doing welfare projects with the balance being split between trying to learn Korean, training priesthood members, providing pastoral leadership, and teaching new converts. Gardner recalled that people were joining the church not because of its spiritual message, but because of the help they were receiving to survive in their day-to-day -day existence. He said, quote, I didn't see that there was a lot of understanding of what community of Christ tradition and religion meant. There were deep attachments, very deep feelings in response to the love they had been shown. But a lot of people, I think, 
knew very little about religion, end quote. <coughs> Pardon me. Gardner noted that, especially once the building was opened in 1963, the very nature of the church in Korea was changed. Crowds would gather each morning at the gate seeking help. Gardner said, quote, people were not attracted to the message, but to the giving we could do. Many were baptized, but their commitment was not to the ideals of the church, end quote. By the time of the 1988 Summer Olympic Games in Seoul, the Korean economy had developed to the extent that all the church's welfare and social ministry efforts were redundant. Les Gardner recalled the difficulty of teaching about tithing and financial stewardship. Korea church members became dependent on support from church headquarters and expected such financial support to continue. Late in 1996, in a budget discussion at the Seoul Church, a couple of older adult church members who had joined in the early 1960s, but were now long established in well-paying careers, told me this, quote, Brother Gardner said we didn't have to tithe, end quote. Clearly, they remembered their high school years and the church's then prevailing stewardship practices of tithing on increase. And as high school kids, they didn't have any income, let alone increase. In the late 1990s and early 21st century, the church's redefined mission statement with the enduring principles has helped create a newly focused approach in Korea that attracted several new young people, young adult church members. One man uh, recalled, quote, I don't have any interest in church history and I don't care about Joseph Smith. What I found in the Yanidong congregation at Seoul was a community where I could share my giftedness, bring my friends to share, and belong to a church where there was freedom for everyone to be leaders, rather than a pastor taking charge and giving restrictive top-down leadership. The church is a special community with a unique atmosphere and environment, end quote. One of the first theological challenges in Asia was to find a suitable translation of the denomination's name. This proved problematic to the first members and missionaries. Although the motivation of Joseph Smith III and the church leaders at the time was good, uh, the word reorganized uh, in Asian languages has a relatively negative connotation, which is used with bankruptcies. Uh, also, the phrase Latter-day Saints particularly in the translated versions uh, in Korea, Japanese, and Chinese, implies end of the world in a desperate, you know, uh, apocalyptic sense. Uh, even the LDS church has recently changed their name, although still translated as Latter-day Saints, the Chinese characters used for that has changed to later time period saints. And it, it doesn't have the apocalyptic uh, connotation that had cult written all over it. Neff suggested that the church in Asia adopt the name translated into the local languages, but never used in English of restored church of Jesus Christ, which the members quickly accepted. Many in the American church, however, including members of the first presidency felt that the full name of the church must be used in any language. A letter from church president W. Wallace Smith to Apostle Naff expressed his rejection of the suggestion. He demanded that regardless of what country the church might be operating, the full name of the church could not be changed under any circumstance. He criticized Neff for unilaterally making a name change. Neff, however, was not suggesting a change in the English language name of the church, but only in local languages where the church was operating and retaining the English language name as the legal name and in publications alongside the local languages. The dispute continued for several months until finally the first presidency relented and granted their permission for the revised name. I'm not sure they ever came to see eye to eye with Neff on the matter. The name Community of Christ was adopted in 2001. Many in the American church, including high-ranking church leaders, believed that finally the denomination had found a universal name 
that could be used in any language in any place. Unfortunately for the parts of Asia that use Chinese characters as a root uh, foundation for vocabulary, the words for community are either too generic, such as in public telephone, or uh, public being the key word there, but generic, public telephone, public so on. Or it's too politicized, such as communism. In Korea, we made the choice to use community of Christ in English and to spell it phonetically in the Korean alphabet. Of all the Asian languages, Korean is the only one that has a phonetic alphabet that's easy to use, and so it was easier to do it that way. It has not been so easy in other parts of Asia. Community of Christ has been committed to Northeast Asia, including Japan and Taiwan now for several generations. Seoul remains the largest of the four congregations. There are two in Japan and one in Taiwan. Although numerical statistics and the development of a robust indigenous church leadership have failed in every case, the church's efforts have been valuable and have had a positive effect on thousands of people. Qualitative rather than quantitative measurements of success would, be, would, would help evaluate the church's uh, missional success, but it's hard to get a handle on qualitative statistics. Uh, in Korea, indigenous leaders are waiting to be trained. We have many members who want to have their service honored and want to serve. Community of Christ priesthood system in which ministers are ordained with little or no training except for a couple of temple school classes is challenging to implement because there are no experienced disciples, no experienced priesthood members who can be mentors for the new folks. We'll probably have to continue to struggle to build that sort of leadership in years to come. When Westerners have come in, uh, they've tended to take over the entire operation, leaving local members to take a back seat. Uh, the reverse desperately needs to be implemented somehow, and I'm, I'm as much at fault on this as anybody else. I could not see what needed to be happen, what needed to happen in Seoul. Uh, it just, and, and I, I took some wrong turns many times. Uh, <clears throat> but in a, in a climate where the denomination values diversity, but requires conformity with the, the denominational identity and observance of policies, we really need to find a way to develop local leaders who can stand on their own. The economic costs required to have expat leaders assigned to live in or even travel periodically to Korea is phenomenal. To be successful, expat leaders need a solid foundation in cross-cultural ministry. They need a better understanding of uh, Korean culture, how to communicate, the use of language, even the methods of logic and reasoning are different in Asia from the West. The West, based on Greek linear logic, uh, is incomprehensible here in Korea. The, the logic is more circular in nature, and uh, it's a real challenge. Uh, skill in languages and cultures uh, in the areas where they would serve is it's not an option. It's, it's, and, and it can take years to become just basically conversant in Korean. Uh, we should have long ago planned for leaders to focus on learning the language first with no other demands uh, until they achieved a certain level of fluency. That will take probably a year of total immersion in language training. Uh, so the church also needs to look at much longer term involvement of such leaders. Uh, five year terms are much too short. Um, in, in the society that we have in Korea, it takes years to develop a trust relationship uh, between the outsiders and the insiders. And, and even so, as much as the church uh, folks love all of us 
you know, outsiders. Um, in the Korean way of looking at people, we're sort of still unpersons. And that's a challenge, and it's hard to overcome that. But our current financial situation in the denomination makes that sort of planning just nothing that can be done right now. Uh, well into the second decade of the 21st century, Community of Christ is the only denomination with a congregation in Korea that still relies on foreigners to supervise, uh, to take the main leadership roles, and uh, to control financial and asset management. With only one congregation in Korea, opportunities for Community of Christ are limited. Uh, for example, even though I live in Seoul, I, I have to plan an hour and a half to get to church. Uh, I do that willingly, but it is time consuming. Uh, I have to combine about a half a mile of walking, one train and one bus. And then I reverse that when I come home from church. Two other church families live in my vicinity. Another family lives even further south in an extended suburb of the city. The vastness of the city and the transport challenges, uh, and no, driving a car would not help. It might even take longer uh, with the congested roads and gasoline at seven or $8 a gallon. It's not a great option. Uh, the scattered nature of members poses a challenge for us to develop what we value as community in Community of Christ. This year, uh, 2020, has been devastating to our congregation here because we've not been able to meet in person uh, since February. We did have one time in late March where there was a lull and it seemed like it might be safe. Uh, but even then we couldn't have our fellowship time or even sing hymns. <clears throat> so there's, there's not only logistical challenges to inviting people to Christ, uh, the increasing increasingly secular nature of society in a country that has gone from rags to riches in a few short decades makes religious involvement a low priority for most Koreans. Uh, the ultra conservative and vocal Christianity that permeates uh, South Korea uh, with their loud rants about all the fundamentalist hot button issues has promoted such a negative image about church in general that when I tell people I'm a minister, they run away from me as fast as they can. Uh, I've modified my approach. I tell people I'm a friend of Jesus, which gives me about five seconds to tell them something uh, before they run away as they look at me curiously wondering what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm not like most Christians they've heard about. And most Koreans can't conceive of that possibility. Uh, Christianity, both Catholic and Protestant, claims about 25% of the population. Buddhism, which held sway over the peninsula since the 500s CE, now claims about 20%. In the 2015 census, which is the most recent census, a whopping 56% reported no religion at all. The social issues, which claim so much time for the church in the U.S. and Canada, are different in Korea. Uh, very little need for food banks and LGBT plus issues uh, are difficult in a hierarchical society like we have here. Uh, the missional work that we applied ourselves to in the 1960s and 70s has not been needed. And uh, we still haven't found a successful approach to being relevant to the changing times. Uh, with an economy that is in the top 10 or 11 economies of the world, education is readily available. There's a national medical system that makes access to medicine relatively inexpensive and easy to do. Uh, we don't need to set up remote clinics in the countryside or distribute used clothing or sponsor a free school for girls. I think we're going to continue to have to grapple with these issues in the foreseeable future. Uh, I have some uh, slides uh, to show. Let me uh, get my screen share going here so that we can look at those. OK. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, this is our first building. Uh, it's a really old photo and it's not very clear, but, but that's what the neighborhood looked like. It was a barren wasteland of a hill. Um, does my mouse show up when I move it? Yes. Okay. Uh, so here's the church building. There's an entry staircase here. And here's one of the missionary houses that were built. There's a, another one back over here that you can't see. It's out of the picture. But you can see there's no paved road. There's not even a main road down below. There's a railroad track just out of sight in the bottom corner of the picture. And that's where we were located. Uh, shortly after the building opened, we uh, built, I think it was Les Gardner told me that they decided to build this bell tower, but they never could find a bell that they could afford to put in it. You can see the road up to the church and the missionary houses behind is still a dirt road. This is what the area looked like uh, when we built the church. Uh, here, this is a railroad track here and these little shanties down here and then fields below. It was a desperately poor neighborhood. This is looking the other direction, uh, sort of to the north from the church into the, the neighborhood of Yanidong or the village of Yanidong. And by, the ni by 1963, it was starting to look a bit more settled with uh, a few brick and concrete structures appearing. Uh, this is the clinic at Mego. Uh, the, uh, you can see the brick and concrete architecture against Korean traditional roof lines. But again, very distant farm village. Uh, it's a little hard to see in this picture, but we put new roof on the church and repaired the bell tower uh, in 1998. A little bit, uh, you can see it a little different with the, uh, we, we took off the zigzag roof. It was, it was sort of collapsing in on itself after decades of use. And we put a good steel and corrugated roof on the building. Uh, we remodeled uh, one of the basement rooms to be a small library and conference room and uh, did some repair work in the sanctuary, installed some new windows, and put on some floor coverings, repainted. Uh, Vacation Bible School, when we had World Service Corps volunteers, was a great event that we had lots of church family related kids. It wasn't so much neighborhood kids as uh, some church families, kids had friends at school who came and got involved. The young adults uh, decided to decorate the yard around the church one summer with the uh, World Service Corps volunteers by painting uh, a gateway to the temple. And uh, well, that you can see the traditional Korean style gate with the traditional pots and then uh, open the doors. And that, that helped us, that imagery helped us make a connection with the broader world church. Uh, we had our first reunion in 2003, ever, first ever family camp in Korea. Uh, these are some of the folks that were there. And every winter we had a young adult ski trip. Uh, we have some wonderful ski resorts not too far from Seoul that uh, provided a great opportunity for the young people to get together, have fun, and spend time. Uh, we had quite a few baptisms at the old church. Um, confirmations. This is a photo of the very last confirmation service that was held in the, in the original building. Uh, with Apostle Jack Kirkpatrick and Bishop Paul Hardwick. Uh, and in 2009, we dedicated the new church building. Uh, the folks here in the photo were part of the building committee. Uh, Jan Craybill came to Korea to help us celebrate that dedication. And uh, <clears throat> the church ladies went all out with traditional costumes and their ever-present smiles. It doesn't matter what the day is, we've always got those kinds of smiles greeting us at church. 
and the new sanctuary. Not different from most sanctuaries, pretty standard layout, but uh, a beautiful place to gather for worship. And uh, this is the, the new building. Well, it's 11 years old now, almost 12. Uh, but it's on a main thoroughfare of the church, so we have good neighborhood visibility. The, the first and second floors we rent to a language school that provides some income. The third floor has an apartment for the missionary family and some other smaller apartments that we rent out to provide a little bit of income. The fourth floor uh, has the fellowship hall, the kitchen, classrooms, and an office. Uh, there's an underground parking garage. Um, doesn't hold all the cars necessary, but because we're right on the main thoroughfare, public transport is easy. The bus stop that I get off the bus is only about 50 yards to the right of the church building, so it's a convenient place to be. And that's what I have to share. Thank you very much for your attention. That was fantastic, Steve. Uh, thank you. We really appreciate you sharing your research with us this evening. For many, this was new information, and I feel like we truly gained a greater understanding of the Community of Christ story in Korea. I especially love that you um, brought the history all the way up to current day, and we were able to see where church members worship even today. It was like a two-for-one special. We got to hear the history <laughs> as well as the modern day story, and that was just the best. I also admit that I think your second lecture was even better than your first. <laughs> well, uh, practice makes, I'm not sure, perfect, but, uh, <laughs> but pretty close. <laughs> Thank you. And You're uh, with that, I'm, I'm saddened that we'll now bring our evening program to a close. Uh, we also want to express our gratitude to our listeners uh, for joining us this evening, uh, our friends in the audience uh, who generously support the Community of Christ Historic Sites uh, with their donations. Thank you so much for your generous support. I also encourage you to tune in next week as we explore Latter-day Saint Missiology with Seth Bryant. Uh, Megan has already dropped a link to the Autumn Lecture Series in the chat box. Follow that link to register for next week's program and be sure to sign up for the bonus lecture with Andrew Bolton. That lecture is called The Power of the Church Seal in the Life of Community of Christ and it will take place on Saturday November 21st at noon central time. So as you can see, there are a lot of opportunities to enjoy church history this fall. Well, until we gather again, please take care. Keep reading your church history and have a good night, everyone. <laughs>